Welcome to Masterclass Cinema, the series where I discuss one aspect of a movie I love and still feel inspired by for its technical achievements. Today I'll be discussing Jaws, a film that still stands the test of time as a masterpiece as well as being hailed as the greatest shark horror film of all time. As a film made prior to CGI, Jaws has yet to be added to the list of data giant monster movies that preceded it. Movies like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Moby Dick. Movies praised for their technical achievements at the time, but now unfortunately show their age. But how has it that this movie from the 1970s has stood the test of time? A lot of factors boil down to the raw storytelling talent of an up and coming Steven Spielberg. Although credit to the novel by Peter Benchley, it's much simpler to write a story about a shark when readers can fill in the blanks, but to show what the shark does in the book on film, that's where Jaws the film stands on its own. But the film isn't just a classic due to the performance of the shark, far from it. The shark isn't properly seen in full into the 1 hour 20 minute mark. Two thirds of the movie have just been people talking and shots of nothing, yet you still remain hooked up until the shark's reign of terror begins. So what this video will be discussing is how much this movie puts in so much creative effort into making you believe in a shark that isn't real. Especially when your biggest special effect barely worked for nearly the entirety of the production. I would also like to introduce my special guest joining me in this video. Hi, I'm Please Rewind, and I make YouTube videos about movies because I'm broke. Anyway, let's talk about the fake shark and Jaws. So, while Jaws was in pre-production, they knew in order to sell an audience on the shark, they at least needed footage of real great white sharks to use in the film wherever they could. Which works best for close-ups of the shark swimming past camera, or wide shots where you subtly see the shark swimming in the distance. And so, they contacted Australian couple and shark documentarians Ron and Valerie Taylor, whose prior credit was for the great white shark documentary Blue Water White Death. They would film the footage of the great white sharks off the coast of South Australia for Jaws. As well as just getting footage of great white sharks swimming around, they rigged up a set piece from the movie script where Hooper is in the cage getting attacked by the shark. So in order to beef up the size of the shark, Spielberg had the idea to build the shark cage in miniature, as well as hired a little person in a wetsuit to perform the character of Hooper. Having a little cage and actor against an already massive great white shark will make it look even bigger. Unfortunately, they ran into problems setting this up and couldn't really really get any good performance footage. One factor being that the actor was petrified of sharks, but also since his air tank was built in small scale, it didn't supply enough air for him to stay submerged like a regular air tank. Even though the actor was short in size, he still had regular sized lungs that require the same amount of oxygen as a regular person. However, while filming, a great white swam into the cage and got caught, to which it started thrashing and going crazy and actually detached the cage from the boat. In the story, Hooper was in the cage, but when the shark detached the cage, it was empty. But rather than seeing the footage as a waste, they actually rewrote into the script that Hooper swam out before the shark destroyed the cage. Ron and Valerie Taylor would also lend their first hand expertise to the accuracy of the animatronic shark they were building before the shoot, which leads us to the next topic. Jaws required a great white shark to do some very specific things on camera that you can't get a real shark to do. Jumping out of the water and landing on a boat, cracking it in half. So a giant animatronic shark was to be built. They contacted Bob Maddy who was responsible for the giant squid in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He was very optimistic about building a realistic shark prop. Ultimately, three massive sharks were built. Two different sharks where one had no left side and the other had no right side, which left half the shark exposed for the puppeteers to access all the hydraulics, and a full shark that was less expensive for the wide shots of the shark swimming under the boat. The sharks were perched on a massive crane arm that would raise the shark up and down, swivel it side to side, as well as a dolly rail system that moves the crane backwards and forwards. And the whole platform that held this massive rig was designed where it could sink to the seafloor and then could inflate to rise back up to the surface. The shark worked flawlessly on land. Typically a giant creature feature like this would be filming in a giant tank on a stage, a much more controllable environment. However, a young and ambitious Spielberg made the decision to film the majority of the film in the actual ocean. Unfortunately, the shark was never tested in stable waters, let alone the actual ocean. And so the sea was very harsh on this animatronic shark and it constantly malfunctioned, making the film go over schedule and over budget. Eventually they figured out the technical issues and the shark did finally work. 
There was the option to film in the Bahamas where the water is shallower, where they did the fourth movie, but it just doesn't look right. Seeing the shark burst out of the dark abyss is still a stunning sight by today's standards. Especially this shot which hardly gets included with the initial reveal. This is so quick and haunting, it's shocking how it never gets brought up by anyone. And by framing out the island from all the background shots, it really sells that they are far out at sea alone. In addition to the full prop, they had a shark fin and a tail on a sliding track, which still makes for equally creepy moments. After they wrapped up production on location, they then returned to a tank set and filmed the scene with Hooper being attacked by the shark while he's in the cage. Much easier thing to do. As good as the mechanical shark was, in the duration of filming when it was malfunctioning, it was up to Spielberg to figure out different ways to imply the presence of the shark to make up for the failures of the animatronic shark. And that's really where things get good. In the absence of the visual shock, it was tasked to Spielberg to figure out different ways to let the audience know when the shark was there. When Chrissy is being attacked at the start of the film, she was meant to be shown getting devoured by the shark. In place of that, they rigged her up in a harness with cables leading from either side of her hips. Off screen, there were operators that would jerk her in either direction, which created the amazing violent opening scene. An obvious trope of horror films is to have the point of view of the threat. This was used heavily in Jaws, which still perfectly adds to the believability of the shark, as the camera swings swims through the legs of the splashing swimmers, there's great audio edits where what the people hear is commotion and splashing. When it cuts to the POV of the shark, it's more silent and muffled. When the guys try to catch the shark with the hook chained to the jetty, the shark proves to be so strong that it rips the jetty in half. And now just the debris is floating in the water and they treat that as if it's the shark. As it's drifting outwards to sea, the guys think that they are safe until the debris then rotates in the water and heads back towards them. At that point, you wouldn't even need to show the shark. But aside from the animatronic puppet, the other get around to not showing the shark is using the yellow barrels to represent the shark's presence. They are almost like a character in of themselves. Now what? When the barrels show up, you know the shark is there. When they vanish, you know the shark has swam deeper and away. All of these were just on the spot brainstorming solutions that went on to be hailed by critics for its less is more approach. All that being said, with the mechanical shark not working, showing the barrels in its place, to just showing the shark's point of view, the final technical addition to the shark's presence is one of the most memorable in cinema history. If you mention Jaws to anyone, what are the chances they would think of the John Williams music before the actual imagery of the film itself? I'd say chances would be pretty high. John Williams is mostly known for his adventurous wonderment scores such as Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park. But before all that, he was tasked with scoring a horror movie about a killer shark. And still to this day, his haunting, thumping theme of the shark when it's stalking its victims remains one of the most terrifying scores in movie history. It's the official soundtrack of having a fear of the ocean in general. There are some other interesting creative decisions Williams made in regards to the score. The thumping theme when the shark is on screen. But when our heroes seem to be one-upping the shark, the score sort of burst into this adventurous old school pirate theme. And as the shark gets the last laugh, the happy theme fades out whenever our characters are defeated. Outside of that, there is a clear set rule when cueing the shark theme. It will only play when the shark's presence is actually there, and it'll be absent when the shark is not the threat. Part of the genius of John Williams is how he spots music and how he places music in a movie. You know, uh, and John did not want music to celebrate a red herring, he only wanted music to signal the actual arrival of the shark. When the kids are swimming around with the cardboard fin, the theme is absent. Run. Run. To this day, I believe the film would have only been half as successful. 
I think the score was clearly responsible for half the success of that movie. Despite all the special effects and filmmaking techniques used to make this shark feel real, the three main characters and their specific roles within the story are also making this happen. You believe in the shark as much as they do, yet all three have very different perspectives about the creature and how to deal with it. The character of Quint is one of the greatest false senses of security in this movie. This film treats him like he's the knight in shining armor that will ultimately kill the shark and save the day. Then it comes as the biggest shock when he dies at the end. Quint has one of the most amazing entrances in cinema history. During the town meeting after the death of Alex Kittner, everyone is in a panic over what to do about the shark. Suddenly the rambling is halted by the sounds of Quint's fingernails scratching down the chalkboard. What follows is a very long dolly shot towards him as he gives his own introduction and all of the townsfolk are just looking at him in awe. He names his price of killing the shark, no negotiation. $10,000 for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. Shortly after they reveal a shark has been killed and captured. While all the fishermen, Brody and the mayor are celebrating, Quint is laughing from his boat. From that distance he knows that's not the shark. Also, after all the fishermen have returned in their boats, after a full day of hunting the shark, Quint is still in his boat. Sort of a visual representation that the work isn't finished yet. When Hooper makes the discovery of what species of shark is stalking Amity Island, there's only one person for the job. Finally, after the guy is killed in the pond, the decision is made to hire Quint. And that's why you're going to do the right thing. That's why you're going to sign this and we're going to pay that guy what he wants. $10,000. $200 a day, whether I catch him or not. Then we get to see life inside Quint's shack, and it's filled with shark jaws mounted all over the walls. This is where it sets in your mind that Quint is the man for the job. His shack is littered with shark death, even has new shark jaws boiling in a pot. He's also responsive to how others perceive sharks and how he hunts them. Brody is terrified of the ocean, but has the respect for Quint in hiring him to kill the shark. So Quint sort of treats him like an impressionable kid the whole movie, teaching him about the fisherman's life as the movie progresses. Comes out of the hole, goes back into the cave again. It's not too good, is it, Chief? Hooper, on the other hand, is only interested in studying sharks, to which Quint sees his presence on this expedition as a hindrance. And get a good man these days under 60. So Quint has no respect for Hooper and gives him a hard time any chance he gets. What are you, some kind of half ass astronaut? <laughs> Yeah, that's real fine, expensive gear you brought out here, Mr. Hooper. I don't know what that bastard shark's gonna do with it. Might eat it, I suppose. Seen one eat a rocking chair one time. After all the deaths that lead up to the three men going on the boat, you wouldn't assume anyone would die after that point, because you're in Quint's safe hands. Although Quint insinuates that Hooper might by putting himself in harm's way. You go inside the cage. Cage goes in the water. You go in the water. Shark's in the water. Our shark. Quinn's approach to shark catching is a bit more cruel. See what I do, Chief, is I trick them to the surface and I jab at them. I'm not gonna haul them up like a lot of catfish. Quint would never put himself in harm's way of the shark. All the confidence in Quint is ultimately shattered when he gives the USS Indianapolis speech, letting down his heroic image to reveal a traumatic past with sharks, and that he hunts them out of revenge, not for sport, which then leads to his slow descent into madness as the shark begins outdoing him at his own game, which ultimately leads to his death. The master hunter of sharks dies at the jaws of the very creature he spent his life killing, which he sort of predicts in his USS Indianapolis speech. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. Oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red, in spite of all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and rip you to pieces. <laughs> However, with Quint proving to be incapable of taking down this incredible beast, the shark expert that he had been giving a hard time the entire movie would suddenly prove his worth. Hooper. Hooper! 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 Who doesn't love this character, guys? I mean, he's easily one of the greatest characters in movie history. But one of the great things about him is how he is a scientific expositional element of this movie. Just when the events of the shark could lean into monster movie territory, he's there to keep Brody and the audience on point. Well, this is not a boat accident. It wasn't any propeller. It wasn't any coral reef. And it wasn't Jack the Ripper. 
It was a shark. The more scientific information you get about the shark and its behavior, the more you can believe its presence regardless of seeing it. He doesn't talk about sharks as evil creatures like Quint does and what the island folk fear. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. <laughs> for the most part, that's all Hooper is treated as for the majority of this film. The exposition man. Starting with his introduction, there's no fancy camera moves, flat wide shot standing next to the Ben Gardner character who towers over him. Hello. Hello back, young fella. How are you? And even gives a quick tease to how the master fisherman Quint will treat him later on. Say, I hope you're not going out with those nuts, are you? In fact, this movie instantly sets up that fishermen don't respect shark experts. Can you tell me if there's a good restaurant or hotel on the island? Uh, you walk straight ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all gonna die. Oh, yeah, well, but what kind? What kind of shark? Tiger shark. A what? What is this bite radius what, crap? That is a big mouth. Look at it. Look at all it. I'm, you know, I'm gonna stuff your you. freaking head in there, man, and hey, find out if it's a man. You know, all right? But this plays into Hooper's rivalry with Quint. Quint doesn't like the idea of some college boy on his boat trying to observe and research the shark. Maybe a big Yahoo in the lab, but out here, just super cargo. If you don't want a backstroke home, you get down here. Also, he just assumes Hooper isn't prepared to get his hands dirty. You got city hands, Mr. Hooper. Counting money all your life. All right, all right. Hey, I don't need this. I don't need this working class hero crap. Which is ironic seeing as Hooper is very hands-on ever since he got to the island. He wanted to see the victim firsthand. He's the first one to cut open the tiger shark and fish through its stomach. And he's more on Quint's level than Quint gives him credit for. Just tie me a sheep shank. I haven't had to pass basic seamanship in a long time. You didn't say how short you wanted it. How's that? So in a movie where the horror scenes so far have come from people getting killed by a shark in the water, Hooper gets in a wetsuit and dives into the murky abyss just to check out the wreckage of a boat. What a badass. This is really interesting. The scene isn't played up to have Hooper be in the danger of the shark attacking him, really. The scare even comes from finding another victim, and is also where he finds the tooth and discovers that the shark is a great white. This is setting up Hooper's counter false sense of security after Quint proves to be ineffective in killing the shark. After how much of a hard time Quinn has given Hooper this whole movie, including all the other characters on the island? Those proportions are correct. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. <laughs> Despite him proving his financial worth from ocean research. Who pays for all this stuff? Government? I pay for this mostly myself, actually. You're kidding. No. Rich? Yeah. Once the boat shuts from Quint forcing the speed back to shore, he has to swallow his pride and turn to the equipment Hooper brought onto the boat. Hooper, what exactly can you do with these things of yours? Suddenly the hierarchy of who's in control shifts to Hooper, when the heroic shark hunter can't defeat the shark with his emotionless fisherman hateful ways. Suddenly everyone turns to the nerd with his technology. Not such a weak college boy now. Assembling the shark cage and filling the hypodermic spears with poison, it's now up to Hooper to kill the shark. But just as before, the second expert on the boat falls to the awesome might of the shark. Hooper is startled by the silent killer, dropping his spear. Following is the shark completely demolishing his anti-shark cage, forcing him to flee the scene. One of the greatest aspects of this movie is they give you so much hope from the two shark experts they put on the boat. With these two, how could they possibly lose? Which makes the threat of the shark even greater when they are both at a loss. Whoever have one do this before? I don't know. And just when everyone is doomed, the movie finally shifts hope onto the shoulders of the most unlikely person. Out of the three characters, Brody is basically the one who has the town's interest at heart. Quint was only willing to kill the shark if the town coughs up the money for it. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. I'll find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for 10. Hooper was only called in to give an expert's opinion on the situation. Even though he genuinely cares if people get killed by a shark, his interest on going on the boat is more to document such a large great white shark than anything. Please go to the end of the pulpit! Back four! I need to have something in the foreground to give it some scale! Foreground my ass! 
The only time Brody talks about his life as a small island sheriff, or rather drunkily brags about it, is when he and Hooper are on the boat after opening up the tiger shark. He's reflecting on being a cop in New York City. I'm telling you the crime rate in New York will kill you. There's so many problems, you never feel like you're accomplishing anything. Violence, rip-offs, muggings. Kids can't leave the house, you gotta walk them to school. But in Amity, one man can make a difference. After living in that world, the flip side now is that he is the most important law official in this small island community, which isn't even impressive to Hooper. In 25 years, there's never been a shooting or a murder in this town. Wrong thing. Wrong pretzel. The worst that Brody has to deal with is the mundane issues from everyone in the town. Now we got a bunch of calls about that karate school. It seems that the nine-year-olds from the school have been once the shark begins attacking swimmers on the beach, it really shakes up the small island community. Suddenly after being bombarded with mundane demands from the town, now there is a real problem for Brody to deal with. Conflicted by a killer shark on the loose, as well as putting people in harm's way due to the greedy mayor. Being forced to keep the beaches open so Amity can remain a successfully financial beach town for summer. Keeping his town's interest first, Brody tries taking initiative by getting Matt Hooper in to assess the shark problem, as well as demand the mayor hire Quinn to kill a shark. We're not only gonna have to close the beach, we're gonna have to hire somebody to kill the shark. Uh, I think that I am familiar with the fact that you are going to ignore this particular problem until it swims up and bites you on the ass. It isn't until the third victim is claimed by the shark that Brody can finally take charge of the situation. I love this shot of him running down the center of frame with the townsfolk on the right side of frame and just water on the left. It's like a visual prediction that this one man is what stands in between the town and the killer shark. One of the best traits about Brody is he learns as he goes, like the perfect protagonist for the audience to follow, especially in a film with unbelievable events that not every normal person would experience. The other characters sort of treat him like an inexperienced teenager. Damn it, Martin! Well, what the hell kind of a knot was that? You pulled the wrong one! Hey, Chiefy. Next time you just ask me which line to pull, right? But as the events on the boat play out, Brody begins analyzing the situation for himself. He may be inexperienced and in way over his head, but Brody's hidden talent is learning fast. Which begins his understanding of the shark based on mixing both Quint's hateful and Hooper's scientific points of view. But unlike Hooper and Quint, Brody sees the massive imposing shark for what it is and doesn't have the clouded confidence that the other two experts have. What's the point? Books and lines. You lose one, you rig one. You're gonna need a bigger boat. But if I can get him close enough to this cage, I think I could get him in the mouth or That the shark put that cage to You got any better suggestions? All of this finally leads to the conclusion. After all the shark experts have been taken out of the picture, and the last person left is the one who never even thought about sharks prior to these events. You know, Alan, people don't even know how old sharks are. I mean, if they live two, three thousand years, they don't know. Enough. And out of all the praise we have given to this movie, for how it keeps this story locked on the scientific track, there are two things that stick out as unrealistic by today's standards at the end of this movie, but work perfectly given how this movie has established scientific yet fantastical credibility. The first being the shark jumping on the boat and cracking it in half, and the shark keeping an air tank in its mouth long enough for Brody to crack shoot it, blowing up the shark. Because he said to me, the ending of the book is a downer. The shark gets stabbed with a harpoon, can't hold up the barrels, and eventually drowns. Spins slowly to the bottom, and the movie, or the book, the story ends, if you will. The characters are saved. That is not a big, rousing ending, and I need a big, rousing ending. Given everything this video has just discussed in terms of this film's believability, Peter Benchley's anecdote about how Spielberg convinced him of the new ending perfectly justifies its believability or not. So he said, here is what I propose to do. And he told me the ending that he had in mind. And I said, Stephen, that is completely unbelievable. It can't happen. A shark does not bite down on a scuba tank and explode like an oil refinery. He said, I don't care. If I have got them for two hours, they will believe whatever I do for the next three minutes because I've got them in my hands. His ending 
brought people to their feet screaming, yes, 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 this is the way it should be. Brody shooting the air tank still doesn't even come out of nowhere. This ending is foreshadowed very early on in the movie and continues planting that air tank in the back of your mind as the film plays out. First, when Brody is flicking through the book on sharks, he stops on an image of a shark with an air tank in its mouth. Later on, when he accidentally releases the air tanks behind the shark cage, followed by a cranky lecture from Hooper. This is compressed air. You screw around with these tanks and they're gonna blow up. Shortly after this, the shark knocks the boat, seeing as Brody is a very observant character, runs straight to the air tanks to keep them secure. Finally, when Brody is the last one left and the shark bursts into the cabin to attack him, he uses the last remaining air tank to beat the shark in the head, followed by throwing the tank in the shark's mouth. Arming himself with a harpoon and a rifle, Brody makes his way to the top of the mast for a final showdown. The shark bursts out of the water and we can still see the air tank in its mouth. Now a shark probably wouldn't keep an air tank in its mouth, would have spat it out by now, but in this movie's universe, we have this moment early on to make Brody assume this. He didn't need that car, did he? No. <laughs> Tiger shark's like a garbage can, it'll leave anything. Someone probably threw that in a river. Finally, the shark doubles around, races towards Brody. He's firing off the rifle, aiming for the tank, makes a one in a million shot, and the monster is destroyed. Reality may be great and truth may be wonderful, but none of it holds a candle to believability. And if the filmmaker has done his job and brought you into believability, he can do anything. Play by the rules, set the rules, but follow the rules. And that's exactly what Steven did. Regardless of the unrealistic ending, you completely buy it because the final blow wasn't delivered by either of the two shark experts that kept you grounded in reality, but rather by the character that represents the audience. You went on the journey with Brody, you learnt as he learnt, and after being shown throughout the film to be out of his league surrounded by all the experts, this movie proves one thing. But in Amity, one man can make a difference. In the end, I think the thing that makes Jaws stand out after all these years is the way it lets us appreciate the craft of Steven Spielberg. A lot of his later movies would be great, but Jaws is more stripped down and character focused than most. You feel a sense of discovery with this movie, Spielberg becoming a master of telling stories through images. Jaws knows something that most modern blockbusters have lost. It's more about the quiet moments than the loud spectacle that can overwhelm us. In all honesty, the shark effects don't hold up very well, but it doesn't matter. It was never about that. We go back to Jaws because of everything they built around the shark. That's what makes it feel so real. Originally this video was just going to focus on the technical aspects of the film, but when it comes to this movie making you believe in a shark that's not real, a lot of the effect is from the three main characters. From the novel by Peter Benchley, the direction of Steven Spielberg, and the improvisational performances from the brilliant lead actors. I believe one of the biggest reasons Jaws remains the classic it is today is because the movie has so many elements and themes outside of a killer monster. The shark represents so many different things, a true crisis for a town to deal with, as well as a test for all of our characters to overcome, some more than others. Even despite being such an effective horror movie that made people afraid to go to the beach for decades, it's more than just a horror movie. It has actual intelligent characters that learn and grow. Two experts on the main threat with conflicting points of view to each other, not a cast of stereotypes that gets picked off one by one. This movie treats its audience intelligence with respect, as well as takes you on a ride, despite having a shark that's not real. And that is why Jaws is a masterclass of cinema. Adieu to you fair Spanish ladies, farewell and adieu to you ladies.